Right. Good morning. I love that song. Freedom. Zach Williams, if you're interested, who sings that. Um, so we have been in this freedom series for four weeks now. This is our final message, and I'm really excited and um, ecstatic to get to preach. Um, I won't lie. Sometimes you do something, and uh, you just want it to be done. You want to get it over with. But when I preach, it's not how I feel because I'm excited for this church. I'm excited for the Word of God, and uh, I just I just want God to do great things at Cross Community. So if you've been with us, our Freedom Series, we've walked through three different things so far. Um, week one at Easter, it was freedom from death. So we walked through the resurrection, of course. We walked through the life that we can have in Christ and how He has freed us from the death that we had been living in previous to faith and life in Christ. We had freedom from sin. We had freedom from shame. And we've heard these really incredible testimonies of how God has changed people's lives. And, I'm, and it just makes me really proud to be at Cross Community where God is obviously at work. And lastly today, um, we're, we're ending with freedom to live. And I can't help, about, um, I can't help but think about living and, and freedom without thinking of this experience I had when I was a, a little bit of a younger father. Now, I'm not... Um, my kids are only five and uh, or four and one, so it's not like I've had a, a lot of years of being a father under my belt, but um, I've had some unique experiences and things that I, I just wasn't quite uh, prepared for, and I found out actually they weren't so um, unique after talking to other parents, but um, how many of you have, have had kids that they watch the same thing over and over and over and over and over? So um, for us, um, you know, we, we watch a lot of kids' TV now, um, shows, and some are good, some are bad, uh, but for my son, when he was about two, uh, somewhere in that age range, um, he loved the movie Moana, and we'd watch Moana, and we'd watch it again, and again, and again, and again, and I actually grew to love it. Um, I love the movie Moana, <clears throat> and so uh, if you know much about Moana, Moana was a, a Polynesian Pacific Islander girl and uh, she grew up on this island, and her, her father was chief. And so her father had been preparing her basically from um, a young age uh, all the way up in, until she's older to, to become chief, to become leader of her people. Um, yet this whole time, if you've seen the movie, Moana has this fascination and this curiosity with the ocean, right? She always wants to, to play, to swim, um, to be in the ocean. Her dad's saying, no, Moana, the ocean's not for you, No. You're the chief. You have responsibilities. You need to learn how to lead our people. You need to learn our ways and the things that we do and fall in to the traditions and the ways that we do things on this island. Moana gets older. That curiosity can't leave her. She gets caught in a boat one time, and her dad's like, Moana, how many times have I told you? No boats. No boats. You're getting prepared to lead our people. You need to be a good leader, a good chief one day. Moana's crushed, of course. Uh, she can't help but look out at the ocean, be curious, and wonder what lies over the horizon. What is out there that we're not experiencing right now? If you've watched the movie, you find out that Moana's people were actually descended from, from sea-exploring people, from people that were masters of the ocean, that went from island to island. Yet, if you watch the movie, what I find incredibly fascinating is that the people— the chief and the chief before him and the chief before him and the people had lost out on the life they were supposed to be living and the heritage that they had because they had subjected themselves to rules and regulations that in result ended in, in uh, loss of life. And if you watch the movie, you, you all obviously know uh, that the fish had dried up, that it was getting harder and harder to live the way they, they were living because they had subjected themselves to rules and regulations. They had lost the freedom that they were supposed to have. They were not living the life that we were supposed to have. And I wonder, um, kind of the idea here is that they had subjected themselves to rules, to regulations, to things that they thought were good, but in the end were actually stealing the life that they were supposed to be living. I can't help but think, how does that um, affect us as parents, as, uh, as husbands, as wives? I think about it with kids. Um, if all the interaction I had with my son and with my daughter was to constantly be telling them no. My son's name is Everett. Everett, no. Don't do this. Don't do that. 
Now, these things can be good things like, hey, don't touch the hot fire, right? Like, don't touch the stove. It's hot. These are good things, right? No. But if all the interaction he has with me as his father is to say no, then I miss out on the life I can have and the relationship that I can have with my son by going out and playing baseball with him, by doing the things that he loves to do with him, by experiencing life with him. If I become so focused on the things I shouldn't do that I lose out on the things I should be doing, I lose my joy as a father, right? What about as a a husband? Um, If I become so focused on the things I shouldn't do as a husband, then I lose out on the joy of being a good husband to my wife. So let me give you kind of an example that I think is kind of funny. Uh, But I'm kind of like a twitcher. uh, My my leg is always moving, and uh, my wife hates it. So imagine um, I'm sitting on the couch, my feet are crossed, and I'm always, like, moving my, my foot just like this, like, all the time I want to do it. But it's, like, shaking the whole couch. And my wife's like, oh, my gosh, quit doing that. Like, you know, I, I've learned. I think I've kind of quit it. And I'll, I may be living, like, a fantasy and think I'm good. And my wife's like, no, I just kind of got used to it. I don't know. But if all I ever experienced in my life when, when I relayed to my wife was, I know she doesn't like some of the th- these things. So, you know what? To win as a husband, I'm just not going to do those anymore. Decent things, right? But if I miss out, if, if I live my life by things I shouldn't do, if I choose to focus on the negative and only my goal is to not do the things that she doesn't like, then I miss out on being a good husband. I miss out on loving my wife. I miss out on the relationship that we can have and the, and the life that we can have together, right? When we, we, we become focused on the wrong things, We can lose out on the life that we have. And I fear that that is all too relevant for Christians today. See, when we focus on things that we shouldn't be focused on, when we focus on sin, when we become wrapped up in shame, whenever we focus back on laws and rules and regulations, we steal the life that we're supposed to have as Christians. And so this morning we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5, and we cannot help but talk about life. We cannot help but talk about the way that we're supposed to live as believers without walking through some of the ideas that Paul lays out in the book of Galatians. It's the book, uh, the Christian manifesto on freedom and what life in Christ should look like. So if you would, open up to Galatians chapter 5. Or navigate it into your phone with you version if that's, if that's what you choose to do. That's okay here. What better man to talk about freedom than Paul himself? So, so Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, he says that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So just kind of have to understand a few of the things that are going on because Paul doesn't just say this out of nowhere. This is something he's been building to um, for the past four chapters. But just to kind of understand uh, Paul knew by name many of the churches that were in Galatia. So this isn't like a single church. This is um, a group of churches that Paul had been speaking to and uh, had poured his life into and had shared the gospel with, had started himself, had been a part of. And so uh, Paul obviously had a a lot of love for the Galatian church. And so um, just to kind of understand, Paul was called. He was a Jewish man himself, but his calling from God was to spread the gospel to the Gentile people. That was his purpose, his calling. And so that's exactly what Paul had done. And Paul had been sharing a simple gospel. His simple gospel that he'd been preaching to the Gentile people was that Christ has been crucified, that he's resurrected, that he's overcome death. And now in order to live out life in Christ, in order to have new life, we simply must place our faith in him and we have new life in Christ. That's the simple gospel he had been telling people. As Paul went and he preached all throughout uh, Asia, all throughout all these places that he had been to, um, he radically changed lives. And the Holy Spirit was obviously at work through him and in these churches. Yet, these people that had started off well, that had um, placed their faith in Christ, that were growing and that were doing well, eventually began to be led astray. It's interesting how um, things can be going so well, and then just a little idea a little idea can completely begin to unravel the faith that we have. 
So here's what's going on. At the same time, like sometimes we, we look at, at the early church with uh, like rose-tinted glasses. We think it was perfect. We think it was great. And we think if only we could get back there. But listen, it was messy. It was broken because it was the same as churches today that was led by broken people. So this little bit idea uh, began to take root in the Galatian church, and it came directly from Jewish Christians themselves, including some of the leaders. It was this idea that in order for us to become a believer, in order for us to become a Christian, then first we need to become a Jew. And all they had simply asked people to do was to become circumcised. Get circumcised just like the rest of the Jews, and then you can accept Christ. In other words, they were subjecting themselves back to the law. They were saying, listen, the law is still important, and we need to follow the law. And what you need to do, if you're going to be a believer today, is you need to be circumcised. And so that's what these people were doing. They were going to these churches in Galatia and spreading these ideas. In fact, this is the occasion for, for the book of Galatians. Paul's preaching specifically against this. So again, let's read verse 1, just with understanding a little bit of the context that Paul had been working through. He says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. What is the yoke of slavery that Paul is talking about? In verse 2, he says, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be no value to you at all. What a terrifying thought. Like he was telling these people that had had faith, that knew Jesus. Be careful. There are things that you can do that can cause Christ to have no value to you at all. What a terrifying thought as a believer. Did you know, like this is what I thought as I was reading this, there are things that we can do as believers that can cause Christ to have no value to us at all. There are ideas that we can grasp. There are things that we can live out that reduce the power of Christ in us and that cause him to have no value in us at all. How terrifying. So here's what Paul continues to say. He says in verse 3, Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law you're going to be circumcised, you might as well obey the whole thing. He said, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ, and you have fallen away from grace. Again, this idea of justification, it goes all the way back to ideas that we've already talked about. Paul says over and over that justification, it's a, it's a part of the salvation process that works in our life. Justification is comes from Christ and the blood that he shed. It comes from his work on the cross only. Yet these Jewish people were basically reducing and changing the very idea of the gospel by saying, listen, no, we're we're justified by some of the things we do. You cannot be a believer if you will not submit to this. Paul's saying, no, you're missing the point. We no longer submit to laws. We no longer uh, submit to regulations. We submit to Christ. And justification comes from Christ alone. And so then he, he, he continues in verse 5. For, though, for through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision <clears throat> nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So the main idea that Paul wants the Galatian people to understand is that you don't need circumcision. We don't need the law anymore. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. Faith expressing itself through love. Now, he continues on. I just want to read just like the first part of verse 7. He says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you? To keep you from obeying the truth. Now they were doing well. They were believers. They had churches. They were successful. They were making it in life as as Christians. He said you were doing well. But this little idea has caused Christ to be alienated from you. 
has caused him to be of no value to you at all. And so you want to think about bondage. He said again in verse 1, do not, be, do not subject yourself again to a yoke of slavery. When you're talking about slavery, you want to talk about bondage. What that looked like for the Galatian church was simply coming back to the Old Testament and thinking that they needed to obey that. For believers, uh, I wish that we could say 2,000 years later that that was something that we haven't dealt with in 2,000 years, but uh, that's just simply not the case. There's still this idea that we need to follow parts of the Old Testament, that we need to subject ourselves um, to the law of God. So for believers, first of all this morning, maybe bondage for us looks like submitting ourselves to the law. Maybe bondage for us looks like uh, being caught up in habitual sin, in unconfessed sin, sin that's, that, that we commit over and over and over again, that we think, you know, I'm, I'm going to get up again, I'm, I'm going to make it this time, I'm going to do better, yet we're still stuck in that sin. Maybe bondage for us is, is connected to something that has happened in our past. Again, it could be a sin, it could not be. It could just be something that we had to walk through. Maybe bondage for someone else looks like shame. Looks like the guilt day by day, thinking that, that we're not good enough. Thinking that we're too dirty. Listen, believer, that's simply not the truth. Because we found freedom in Christ. It's for freedom that he has set us free. It's the relationship that we have for him, through him. Do not let ourselves get, uh, do not let ourselves be, become burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I can't help but think as Paul's explaining this to the church, it's not just about sin. Now we focused on sin for much of the sermon right now. We focused on the things that lead us to bondage. But Christians, listen, we are supposed to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. We can't just live our lives focused on the things that are bad. We can't live our lives focused on law, focused on sin, focused on shame. We have to live differently. And so Paul, he, he talks about what it looks like to live in Christ. He says in verse 15, 13, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So we're talking about freedom from the law. We're talking about freedom from sin. We're talking about freedom from shame. And I need to make an important distinction here. We're not saying it's okay to sin. It's not as if sin isn't important. It's not as if uh, being free from, uh, from sin and trying to, uh, trying to avoid sin is not a bad thing at all. But I want you to hear this. This is super important. This is something that, um, I mean, I can't say enough. Listen, believers, if we get to the end of the day and we avoided the sin, we avoided walking in shame, like, yeah, those are good things. But if we get to the end of the day, we avoided the sin, maybe we've been struggling with something particular, yet we have spent no time with Christ that day, then we have failed. I'll say that again. If you get to the end of your day, and you avoided the sin, you avoided the negative things in your life, you uh, avoided the shame, avoided the brokenness, yet you spent no time with Christ, you had no relationship with him that day, then you failed. You become burdened again to a yoke of slavery. Christians, we're called to live in freedom. We're called to live in a different way. And when the outside world looks at us and only sees people that are adhered to a, a book, that only live their life uh, in a way that says, we, we don't do this, we don't do that. Christians don't sin. Like, we don't cuss. We don't do this. We don't do that, right? Then we miss out on our opportunity to show the world what life in Christ looks like. And so Paul says, here's what life in Christ looks like. He says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed. And he says one of my favorite verses in verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful flesh. I can't help but, but stand up here and preach and, and tell you 
about my story. And I, you've heard it a lot. I've had the unmasking. I, I refer back to it. But um, I'm a guy who's walked in habitual sin of pornography. In the habitual sin of sexual sin. It spread far beyond what it should have. And even spread into my marriage. And thankfully, God has done a work in my life. I'm recovering from that. Um, but uh, I learned probably week one, when, I, when things began to kind of turn around. Now, uh, I struggled with this for a long time. I struggled. I was deep in sin. I was deep in shame. Yeah, I thought I could overcome it on my own. I thought I could, I could become strong enough. I could willpower myself enough not to look at pornography anymore. I can memorize enough scripture that I don't have to give in to that sin anymore. I can confess this enough times that I don't have to give in to that anymore. I, 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 right? Probably week one, it was week one. It was week one of CR working through it with Burl that I learned that I was in denial. What did the scripture say? Galatians 5, 16. Walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of your sinful flesh. In other words, it's the work of Christ in me. It's the work of Christ in you that empowers us to not live by the law, to not live in sin, and to not live in shame anymore. Believer, if you've been trying hard and you're stuck in the rut, yet you have no relationship with Christ, start there. You need the work and the power of the Spirit, and you need His sanctification at work in your life. That's where I'm at right now. That's, that's what I'm working on. That's what, uh, that's what I have to confess sometimes whenever we have our, um, our Monday morning men's group with the staff, that I haven't walked well with Christ this week. That I'm still learning what it looks like day by day to walk by the Spirit. Because as I walk in the Spirit, I know that I'm freed from my sinful flesh. And so, yes, we avoid sin. Yes, we try to do those things. But every day we live with Christ. Even if I fail today, today I live for Christ. Even if I'm struggling with shame today, today I live with Christ and I have a relationship with him. And so Paul says um, simply in verse 22, what's it look like for a believer to walk in Christ? First of all, it looks like being reminded uh, day by day that the cross was enough, that we've been changed, that we've been forgiven forever, that our sin, past, present, and future has been forgiven, and that we're a new creation. That's first and foremost. Uh, second, day by day, we, we walk in relationship with Jesus. We read our Bible. We pray. We spend time with him. We listen to him. We submit ourselves to him day by day. And as we do those things, as the Spirit works in our life, as he begins to transform our hearts and our minds and conform ourselves to him, here's what hap begins to happen in our life. We begin to bear fruit. So he says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things there is no law. talk about being the salt and the light of the earth. When people look at us, they should see these things. They should see the fruits of the Spirit at work in us because we're believers. We walk in Jesus day by day. We understand and we, um, we let him work in our hearts day by day. And as he works in us, now this is a slow painful and frustrating process. It's not like today. If we go home today, we spend um, time with Christ. It's not like tomorrow, all of a sudden, all the fruit is there. But the Spirit begins to work in us. The Spirit begins to change us. And day by day, these things start to come out of us. We, we start to become people who live our life by love. People who are full of joy. People who have a peace. Guys, there's a lot of peace that we need in this world right now. I don't know if you've been on social media, but it's, it's pretty dark sometimes. It seems like the world's falling apart. Yet as Christians, we have peace. We 
you have forbearance or patience. People that are full of kindness, even with our words with others on social media, even in the way that we speak to others and, and the way that we live our life, kind people. We become good people. We become faithful people. People who are committed to Christ, people who are committed to our relationship with him, people who are committed in our relationships here on this earth. We become faithful people. We become gentle people. And then we exercise self-control. All these things only come as a result of the Spirit working in us. Understand that this morning. You don't just walk out and think, I'm just become joyful today. You know what? I'm going to practice self-control. No, the Spirit works in us. He brings this fruit out of us. This is the salt. This is the light. When, when people see this, when people see believers who live lives full of this fruit, that's attractive. They want that. They want to know what's different about us. When people see Christians who have hope in Christ, that's attractive. They want something about that. They want to understand what that's like. I want to end with uh, just a, a few points of, of application this morning. And uh, I don't know, I have, a, I have a burden for the church in America. And I, I see a lot of things, and not everything you read on social media is true. Not every slanderous thing they say about Christians is true. I've certainly seen a lot of Christians, though, that don't represent Christ well in the way that we live our lives, in the way that we speak to others, in the things that we do. Jesus says if salt loses its saltiness, then what good is it? It's basically dirt. It's thrown out to be trampled on. We're called to be the salt and the light of this world. You know the way that we do that? The way that we are the salt and the light of this world is by living with Christ day by day. By having a relationship with him day by day. By focusing on, our, uh, on the spirit in us. By allowing the spirit to work out the process of sanctification in us day by day. So, of course, point number one is to simply be the salt in the light of the earth. Matthew 22, verse 37. <clears throat> uh, Paul kind of referred to this whenever he gave some application to the Galatians, but it says uh, the culmination of the law, right, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. What's interesting about this is the Judaizers that came in to Galatia, right, they're saying, listen, if you want to, if you want to please God, be circumcised. If you want to please God, obey the law. What they didn't realize was that they were actually stealing away uh, the, the favor they had from God. They were stealing away their relationship that they had with him because they were focused on this thing whenever they forgot that in the first place. The whole point of the law, the whole point of it ever being written was not so that we become focused on rules and regulations. It was all to point to loving God. Every law either connected us to loving God with everything that we had or, and they said in the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. That's what God wanted from the people in the first place. That's what God wants from you this morning. If you want to be the salt and the light of the earth, love God with everything you have. Love people well. Let the Spirit work in you day by day as you spend time with Him, as you read your word and you grow in your understanding. Be the salt and the light. The second thing is um, to simply to, to focus on freedom. That looks, I think, probably different for, for every one of us. But what that could look like for, that, for us this morning, if we're going to focus on freedom, what we have to do is no longer be focused on rules and regulations. No longer do we get to the end of the day and think, I did pretty good today by avoiding the sin. No, focus on freedom. 
Focus on your relationship with Christ. Be reminded day by day that your freedom comes solely from the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and from nothing else. We have to focus on freedom. And lastly, I can't help, I, I've, I realize, uh, I think basically every sermon has this point of application. And I, I don't know, it's just always so true. And the third thing this morning is simply to devote daily. It's one of the six practices of a disciple. It's one of the things that we ask. If you're going to be a member of this church, if you're going to be a part of Cross Community Church, number one, devote daily. What's that look like for us? That looks like reading your Bible and not just reading it as a check mark, like, okay, I read my scripture today, check. No, it's reading your Bible with anticipation. Reading it and, and asking, God, how are you speaking to me through this? Reading it and listening for the, the subtle voice of the Holy Spirit in our life. Devoting daily looks like praying. And not just praying out as a, as a list of things that I need to ask God. God, will you do this? God, will you do that? God, will you? God, will you? God, will you? But, but saying, God, what are you saying to me today? Receiving from God. Devoting daily means uh, not just limiting yourself to 30 minutes in the morning. Spend your 30 minutes in the morning, meditate on your scripture throughout the day, listening for the, the voice of God throughout the day, praying throughout the day, praying without ceasing, living with God in every moment of the day. If we're going to experience freedom, if we're going to live the abundant life that we have to have, it has to start with devoting daily. That has to be the absolute thing that, that we will not give up, no matter how busy our lives become. Even if, even if we sin, even if we're struggling with shame, day by day, come to our great and our merciful God. Experience a relationship with him. I wanted to end this morning just with a story. I think about Christians who've lived out freedom, Christians who've been salt and light in this earth. Um, and I, I can't help, uh, there's a bunch of people I, I could think uh, about telling you about, but um, one of the, the men who changed my life and, and who God used in a really powerful way was a guy by the name of Bob Cherry. Now, he was the pastor that I was under in Red Oak, not too far from here, small church, small town. And... Uh, Man, that was a great pastor that I served under. And what I loved about Bob, if you met him today, he is the most kind, gentle, and encouraging guy you've ever met. He always has an encouraging word. A guy who's full of love. A guy who will make you laugh. But one of the things I love about Bob is, is not, it's not just about his personality. But Bob was a guy who was always looking for ways that God was using him. That was always open to, uh, to be used by God. And so we would be out eating somewhere. Um, Bob was the guy that was, was going to befriend someone, you know, waiting in the gift shop at Cracker Barrel and share the gospel with them. And he was liable to lead them to Christ right then and there. He was a guy who was a salt in the light of the earth. He was a guy that when you looked at the way that he lived his life, you could tell something was different. He wasn't a perfect man, and none of us are. And we're not called to perfection. We're not expected to be perfect, but we are expected to walk in the relationship day by day and to be able to live out our life because we have the Holy Spirit at work in us, to be able to live morally because we have the Spirit at work in us. Would you guys pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I, I thank you for today. Father, I, I thank you for Cross Community Church and uh, Father, I pray that, that we are a people who live as a salt in the light of this earth. God, I pray that people see that. Father, I pray that we place our relationship with you first and foremost in our life, that we remember day by day to love you with everything that we have, that we remember day by day to love others well. God, may our people in cross community be marked by love. God, you've called this church 
you've set this church here in LaFleur County, Oklahoma. Let us be the light. Let us not be a hindrance. Let us not show people the ugly things of, of faith. Let us not project outward to other people. Slavery, back to indulging our flesh. Slavery, uh, even, even back to indulging or uh, subjecting ourselves again to law. But God, I pray that people see life here. So Father, I pray these things in your holy name. Amen.